Question 71. Paul Teshima is preparing a research report on a new drug called ABXV IV in the oncology in oncology industry. He gets in touch with a few scientists and medical medical professionals working in oncology and obtains information about competing oncology treatments. Most of these these drugs are in the preclinical development phase, which is public information. In his research report, Teshma concludes that ABXV IV might have some competing drugs coming into the market in the next few years if the preclinical and clinical trials prove successful. <clears throat> Has Teshima most likely violated any CFA Institute code and standards? Uh, so we've got one no and two yeses here. So first we got to determine whether he uh, broke any rules. So he's getting his um, information from a few scientists and medical professionals working in the industry. However, it says right here, most of these drugs are in uh, that development phase, which is public information. So really, he shouldn't, he's um, not obtaining anything from these folks that uh, isn't publicly available. And it doesn't mention anything about him um, getting non-public information from uh, it, these scientists or medical professionals. Uh, so we're going to go with no, he didn't violate any rules. Um, he was only looking at public information and didn't obtain, you're allowed to talk to people in the industry um, as long as you're not obtaining uh, non-public information. So no violation here, A. Question 72, Eva Watson, CFA, is a manager at Fern Investments. Watson's compensation includes a base salary and a percentage of fees generated by the firm. It also includes a performance bonus if the client's return is 200 bips higher than the benchmark. Um, Eva did not disclose the compensation arrangement in a meeting with a prospective client. <clears throat> Eva has most likely, uh, so our first choice here, like we've talked about before, is going to be we've got two not violated and a violated. So first thing we need to do is determine whether we violated a standard or not. Um, and as you can recall, um, whenever compensation is tied to incentives, or in general, incentive or performance-based compensation, it's going to cause manager to act differently than the in, if the incentives weren't there. Um, so this is something that should always be disclosed. So it tells us that Eva did not disclose. So in this case, she's going to be uh, B in violation of the standard. John Reed, CFA, is managing the portfolio of Brandy Aniston, a wealthy client. Mrs. Aniston is part of the company's mailing list. She is also informed that she should contact her investment manager whenever there is a significant change in circumstances. It has been more than two years since Reed and Aniston have spoken. Is Reed most likely in violation of standard 3C suitability? Um, so first thing we need to determine here is whether Reed is in violation or not. Um, it doesn't say anything about there being a significant change in Aniston's um, financial situation, so um, that may be why they haven't had any discussions. However, um, it's not you can't put the all the burden on the client to be the one to contact to be in contact if situations change. It's up to the advisor to uh, ensure that there's some. Uh, whether it's monthly, quarterly, annual um, touch, and to make sure that no information has changed um, because it's not always going to be something that's front of mind for the clients. Uh, so two years is going to be too long since our last um, contact. The uh, standards recommend at least yearly. Um, so we've got a yes and two no's, so we can cancel out those no's, and we're going to go with a yes, he has violated the standard. Question 74, Jennifer Lively, CFA, manages accounts for WS Capital. When transacting, tra transacting any trades in her client's accounts, Lively ensures that she does not trade in her mother's account, who is also a client, until all the other clients have been allowed to trade. Is Lively's approach to trading in her mother's account most appropriately, appropriately in line with standard 6B, priority of transactions? So the main consideration 
uh, that we need to account for when looking at uh, family members' accounts, so it's her mother's account, is whether they're a client or not. So the, our decision tree really with the uh, family is going to be, are they a client? If yes, um, they should be treated exactly the same as any other client. Um, if she's a client and we're not trading it until all other clients have been a trade, really she's getting, uh, her mother is getting a disadvantaged service there. So we need to make sure that we're treating all clients the same regardless of family member status. Um, so when we look at our answers here, we've got a two no's and a yes. Um, so we can go ahead and cross out that yes because um, it is not the most appropriate action. Um, so then we can uh, decide here between A and B. No, Lively should not trade in her mother's account at all. Well, she's a client, so she's going to have to trade in her account. So I think we can rule that out. Uh, Lively should treat her mother's account like any other client account. That's going to be our answer, uh, B. So if her mother was not a client, then uh, this statement would be correct. She shouldn't trade um, in her mother's account until all other client trades have been allowed to trade. And that would go for her own accounts, um, Jennifer's accounts, as well as any other family members. Question 75. Chloe Vendetti, CFA, is a business strategist at WQS Investments, an investment firm known for hiring investment managers who have the CFA designation or candidates. Due to this, Chloe claims that her firm offers superior, fir superior returns compared to other firms in the industry in a recent press statement. Historically, the firm has offered its clients above average returns. Under the CFA code and standards, Chloe's claim uh, A did not violate uh, the code and standards by claiming superior returns, did not violate CFA Institute code and standards because historical returns have been above average, or C should not have guaranteed superior returns because their managers have CFA designations. Um, so per the code and standards, you are not allowed to imply any type of uh, factual, anything that's not fact by having the CFA uh, designation or by passing any of the exams or anything like this. So Chloe claiming that due to having the CFA, we're going to offer superior returns. That's going to be a no-no. And some other ways that this can kind of manifest is saying that you're going to be a, that you're a superior analyst because you have the CFA or that you are um, going to, basically if you're guaranteeing something because of the CFA, that's going to be a big no-no. So things that are okay is that it's helped you become a better analyst or better understand um, financial statements or um, has helped you better understand fixed income investments um, and that it's helped you increase your knowledge in a certain area. That's going to be um, perfectly okay, but you can't uh, claim that having the CFA is going to make you or your investment returns superior. So uh, all that to say, we're going to go with C here, should not have guaranteed superior returns because their managers have the CFA. David Liam, CFA, manages portfolios for several wealthy clients. Liam met with Mr. Goal, one of his clients, over lunch. Liam advises Mr. Goal to double his investment in JF JKF Corp as the operational restructuring is expected to bring in higher profitability. To not violate Standard 5 investment analysis, recommendation, and action, what should Liam most likely do when he reaches his office? So we've got A, Liam should record the details of his meeting and investment recommendation. B, David Liam should first verify the suitability of the investment and then execute the order. Um, I think we can go ahead and cross off B right away. Um, he, he, David, he clearly knew he was going to meet with Mr. Goal um, because he was having lunch. So he should have verified the suitability of the investment before bringing it up. And the client's already invested um, in JKF Corp, so it could be, I think, kind of implied that it is a suitable investment. Uh, and then C, David Liam should identify other clients for whom investment in JKF is suitable and inform them about the inspected um, increase in profitability. So A and B both seem like sensible answers. This is where it gets a little tricky. 
um, because C is actually going to be something that we should do, uh, but it's going to fall under standard 3B um, fair dealing. So an important distinction in this question is to not violate this specific um, standard right here, standard 5 investment analysis recommendation in action. Uh, so we're going to go with A and uh, that we should record the details of the meeting. And this is going to fall under the uh, uh, record retention sub portion of the standard. So we go with answer A. Question 77. Which of the following statements are components of the CFA Institute Code of Ethics? Uh, we've got three uh, statements here. And we've got um, our answers are only one, only one and three. Uh, or C, 1, 2, and 3. So if you're working on this on the exam here, just note that 1, 1, and 1, it's going to show up in every single answer. So we know that's going to be um, a statement included in the CFA Institute Code of Ethics. So when you're to save time on the exam, just skip looking at 1 and just kind of focus on 2 and 3, figure out whether these are involved here. So just a little tidbit there that kind of could save you some time. Um, I'm not going to read all these out just because they're a little lengthy, but um, for this question, it's really going to be just kind of about committing these different components of the Code of Ethics to memory um, and knowing which of these doesn't actually fall under there. Um, so we can kind of see here our first component here. Number one, act with integrity. That's going to line up exactly with this first statement here. So we know statement one is a component. Um, and then we've got uh, statement four down here lines up with our practice and encourage others. So we know statement three is going to be involved as well. So we can cross off A here. So if we're at one and three or one, two, and three. Um, statement two, preserve the confidentiality confidentiality of information communicated by clients, prospects, or employers about investment matters. This uh, does not fall under the code of ethics. This is actually going to be under the standards of professional conduct. Um, so it's a little tricky since it is involved in one of the uh, mini ethics documents. Um, but it's not going to be under the code of ethics. We can cross out C and we that leaves us with answer B, one and three. Question 78. Amir Karamelli, CFA, has been very vocal about his views on the CFA exam testing policies. Karamelli's, uh, Karamelli claims that because there are a lot of CFA charter holders, I believe that the CFA Institute deliberately fails students to save the prestige of CFA charter from dilution. Which of the following is most accurate about Karamelli's uh, behavior? Uh, he has not violated the code and standards. He's violated the standard on communication with clients and prospective clients. Um, we can go ahead and rule that out right away. This doesn't have anything to do with communication with clients or prospective clients. Um, so we can rule that out. Or C, he's violated the standard on conduct of members and candidates in the CFA program. Um, He's strictly giving his opinion here because there's a lot of CFAs. He thinks that this is what's happening. They're failing students to save the prestige. Um, you're allowed to give your opinion as a CFA charter holder um, on the CFA Institute, and that can be a negative opinion. Um, so we can rule out C, and we will go with A. He did not violate um, the code. Question 79. When a firm is being verified for compliance with GIPS, which of the following is a verifier most likely to do? So we've got two statements here, one and two, and then we're going to be choosing some combination of uh, those two statements. Uh, a verifier must attest that the firm's procedures and processes for performance presentation are in accordance with GIPS. Uh, that sounds like exactly what a verifier is going to do. They're going to look over the firm's procedures and processes, um, which is important because these procedures and processes are how they are constructing their performance, uh, the performance presentation. Uh, so one sounds like it's going to be true. Um, 
So we know we're going to cross out answer B here. So we're either going to have only one or one and two. So two, a verifier should clearly distinguish the composites for which the verification is done and not done. Um, so when you're getting verification done, you're not sampling, um, which is what it sounds like they're, they'd be doing here. They're doing the verification on all of the composites. Um, so there would be no need to distinguish between which composites are done and not done because they would all have been done. Um, so since we know two isn't correct, uh, we can cross out C now as well and go with A only statement one is um, correct. Question 80. Lena McCarroll and Eric Smith are friends and work for the same investment management firm. McCarroll is a CFA level two candidate. While introducing herself to the clients, she usually mentions that she expects to pass the CFA level two exam in June. On his business cards, uh, Eric Smith mentions that he has passed both levels one and two uh, CFA exams at his first attempts, which is a fact. Are Lena McCarroll and Eric Smith most likely in violation of the standard? Um, Keyword here is, which is a fact, you're related to the CFA and using the de designation, you're only allowed to give facts. Um, so Eric saying that he has passed both of these, which is a fact, that's completely okay. Um, so we can cross off any answer here that tells us that Eric is in violation. Um, so neither of them are in violation, that could still be our answer. Um, only Lena is in violation. That could be our answer as well. And then this one says that Eric is in violation, so we can go ahead and cross off C. Uh, so now let's go and focus on what Lena said. So um, Lena says that she expects to pass CFA level two exam in June. Um, this is not fact. So we're gonna say that she is in violation. Um, to kind of change this, sta this statement up to be fact, she could say that she's um, a candidate for the CFA level two and is signed up to take the exam in June. Um, but you can't say that you expect to pass. And in reality, this is kind of <laughs> implied by taking the exam. I would hope that everyone taking the exam um, is expecting to pass. So uh, since Lena is in violation, we are going to go with answer B.